Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Gross, Extension Educator in Isabella County, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our Field Crops virtual breakfast this morning. This morning, we have Dr. Chris Stefanzo going to be visiting with us today about uh, insect issues for late summer, some of the things that she's been seeing across the, uh, the state. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, you, if you're on a computer, you can type them in the chat room. We'd certainly like to, to get your questions answered and have a conversation about what Chris is talking, to, talking about. Also, uh, if you're on a computer, the link in the chat box allows you to, uh, to evaluate the program afterwards. We'll start off with Chris and then move to Jeff and Drayson to talk about the weather. So Chris, uh, good morning. Okay, very good. I wasn't exactly sure what to do today, so what I decided to do was call through my emails and texts that I had received in the last couple of weeks and pull out some of the more interesting questions that I was getting. Um, one of the big things were uh, huge numbers of thistle caterpillars in soybean. And uh, again, if you're joining this uh, through the computer, you can see the pictures. If you're joining it later, you can see the pictures. And if you can't, we, you can look at this later. And I've received um, I, pictures from Adam Byrne, who's a technician in uh, plant pathology from his plots in Decatur, and also just other random people out there. And I've, I've given them credit here. And the thistle caterpillar is the caterpillar of the painted lady butterfly, which you've probably seen. But there's just incredible numbers this year. And they kind of web up the top of the soybean and live in that little house. And uh, there are... Uh, places out in Iowa and Minnesota, I was on a regional call where they're actually spraying for these. And I suspect it's in these fields that are like V2 soybean and really tiny and, you know, can't handle this kind of thing. But from our standpoint, I think that these thistle caterpillars are now pupating and kind of going on their way. And, and we may begin to see, you know, maybe a second generation. I'm not 100% sure if that's true or not. Um, but they're, they're just kind of a curiosity. And, uh, the other thing that we're seeing are a lot of other defoliators. So massive numbers of these little teeny grasshoppers that are out there. A lot of things eat grasshoppers, so those, those populations are diminishing. There's, of course, the Japanese beetle with their skeletonizing. Uh, bean leaf beetle, we're kind of be um, between the generations there. And then silver spotted skipper, another caterpillar that um, folds part of the leaf in half. I, I call it a leaf taco, and they kind of live in that little taco bit. And there's all of these little defoliators out there. And I just want to be clear that the threshold for defoliation in soybean is quite high. It's 25%. Um, John Obermeyer, my colleague from Purdue, is playing with some image software. There's a lot of image software. And he took apart a plant. He did a really nice job. He actually sent this last night, so I threw it in. And his image software shows this defoliation at almost 9%. So in the field, this might look dramatic to have a couple of top leaves that are, that are eaten a bit, but when you lay it out and you actually look at what that defoliation is, this, is, this isn't even a, a 10%, and remember the threshold's 25%. So be very cautious about spraying for defoliation in Michigan. It's very rare that we ever see something that needs to be sprayed. Um, this year's weird where we've got these little tiny beans out there planted late, but I'm not sure if that's even worth uh, spending more money on those kind of fields anyway. Uh, Eric from uh, our extension agent in St. Joe County sent me this picture, and he asked about what, you know, he's got the Japanese beetle feeding there, but he was also seeing these kind of little cuts in, in, in the leaf, and is that somehow associated with the Japanese beetle feeding? And, and I suspect the, the cut, if you put the two... Uh, pieces together, there's a whole leaf there. There's actually nothing removed. So sometimes you see this kind of situation with hail damage or uh, the leaf is kind of torn in the, in the wind. Um, but the, the, the Japanese beetle itself is not, it was not causing that. So that, that was a good question to ask. Uh, Charles Scoville with Syngenta last night sent me uh, a, a text that talked about finding corn borer and conventional corn. So I keep talking about those darn corn borers are out there, man. They, they have not they did not go away, even though we planted all that BT corn. And this is a big, juicy fifth instar. So this is probably about to pupate uh, soon. And I've seen this in other fields as well. So we're at the end of first generation. This is the, the, the fifth instar of the first generation. I've seen pupation down in southern Michigan. And in Chiawassee County, he's seeing the fifth instars. So we're past the point of control 
for these kind of things. It's they're they're too big and they're they're either in the stock or they're hidden in some way. And this was probably uh, the late the earliest planted corn in, in this area, and that's why it was able to be infested. So in one to two weeks, depending on where you're at, probably a week in the south, maybe two weeks in in mid Michigan, we're going to see second generation uh, flight as these guys uh, pupate and then turn into moths. And the moths at that point will be attracted to younger fields. So you're going to see, uh, you know, an, an older field that may be past attractiveness or not as attractive. And the field on the right in this picture is going to be taller at this point. And that may be um, what, what will be most attractive to moths. Second generation is tough because it's harder to scout. You're looking for egg masses. It's harder to spray. The threshold is not a set threshold based on percentage of plants that have infestation. You have to use a worksheet, which can be kind of complicated if you haven't done it before. Uh, this worksheet is in that new corn borer guide from Iowa State. It, it's also on the internet as well. But the threshold is a dynamic threshold, so I can't tell you what that threshold would actually be until you work it out. The other thing to look for, of course, is western bean cutworm. And uh, Will with Nutrient had emailed me, uh, are, are we seeing western bean cutworm moths? Are we seeing egg laying? So I had received um, from last week, uh, Chad Bowles with BASF had sent me a couple pictures. He was in a pre-tassel field, or somebody was in Albion, and that's a nice fresh egg mass on the top. And I was in the field in Dundee this week, and we not only had uh, fresh egg masses, we had hatching egg masses, and then signs of an egg mass that has already hatched. So egg hatch is underway in the south, and when you're managing western main cutworm and corn, you know, really trapping is key to find peak moth catch, and then you go into the pre-tassel fields. So I put a picture in here. If you can hold that top of the plant and fill that tassel in there, that's what they're really attracted to. Don't ask me why. I don't know if it's plant architecture. They're flying at night, so who knows what they're attracted to. It may even be the smell of that fresh tassel in there. But the egg laying is typically occurring on that top the third of the plant. Always use a, a face shield. If you have one, it makes it so much easier. You'll be so much more accurate. And you're looking for egg masses on the plant and simply counting the number of plants and number of egg masses to generate a percent infestation. And those of us in the eastern corn belt, we've used a, we use a cumulative threshold now. So if you get 3% uh, one week and you scout again and it's 2%, that's threshold. So it's a cumulative threshold. I got this picture. Um, from Elkona County, it said, what are these critters? Is it corn borer? And uh, this is very unusual to see. This is actually a western bean cutworm egg mass on uh, dry beans. It's very hard to find those, and someone happened to see one that was hatching, and they thought maybe it was corn borer. And I've showed you a picture here of western bean cutworm. Uh, it has a big, round, kind of a roundish egg, a very angular egg mass, and it sticks up from the leaf as, compose, uh, as opposed to corn borer, which is a very flat, egg mass that looks like little shingles. And I threw in stink bug here too, this beautiful stink bug egg mass that I saw this week with the little crowns. So make sure that you know what you're counting and what you're looking for. And in dry beans, we're looking for uh, lo locations that have a heavy moth flight. That has really um, like over 100, 120 moths in a bucket total. That's when I would go look at those dry bean fields. You're looking for pod feeding. And is, that, is Chris, is that for a week? No, we're le that's a cumulative catch. A cumulative catch. Yep, that, that's our uh, Greg Varner for a few years uh, found damage in his dry bean variety trials in places where we had as few as 120 moths total, which is very different from the western corn belt where they're, you know, 700 or 1,000 that they're looking for. Okay. So we've used that as a looking at the local, or if your local corn is over threshold, you know, look at those dry bean fields. We actually have a threshold based on pod feeding, the very early pod feeding, and that's a threshold that we developed. 10 or 12% of the pods kind of fed on. We can find pods, you know, we can look at those. It is really difficult. It's impossible to find larvae because they live on the ground in a dry bean field. So, or if you have a big whopping trap catch, most, most of the dry bean growers now they know when and why they, they need to, to treat, and I think we've done a pretty good job. I've got a little bit more time, so here, here's an oddity that uh, uh, was sent in. This is black cutworm in a field not too long ago. 
because the field was very late planted in, in corn. And we would normally, this would be a picture I would show probably in, uh, you know, May, early June, and we're seeing it in July. And uh, she wanted to know, should she spray or is the damage already done? And at this point, this was an organic field, probably had a bunch of weeds early, and the cutworms were pretty big. So at that point, I think we decided uh, not, not to uh, treat. Are you going to comment about the potato leaf hopper? You know, there's swarms of them up here in, in a lot of our alfalfa, and can we expect those populations to, to decline soon, or we just have no, to No, they, they, they will keep um, multiple overlapping generations for the rest of the summer, and typically, as you get into the later and drier parts of the year, which I don't, Jeff can tell us if we're going to be drier and hotter, but... It, the damage by potato leafhopper is such that it's worse under hot, dry conditions. So as we've got dry beans out there. I've seen dry beans with hopper burn that may need to be treated. And then the deal with alfalfa that um, when you're seeing hopper burn, of course, there's already damage that's, that's being done to that plant. Uh, so no, I don't foresee that you're going to have fewer leafhoppers until you get those juicy, wet, Mm -hmm. uh, mornings where you get the entomopathogenic fungus in there. And that may be another th three or four weeks off, if that. So if it were to get quite dry out, then the leafhopper damage would be exacerbated. This was somebody that asked about, uh, is this first generation corn borer? And this is not, this was stink bug damage. You can see the holes have a yellow uh, cast around them. And, and this happened quite early when the plant was rolled up. And then as the plant unfurled, that stink bug's long gone. But another in indication of weediness early. And uh, this is, I think this is my last one. This is just from this week. I was on the edge of a field in Dundee that we're working in, very weedy along the edge, and I saw this plant that just didn't look right. It didn't look like corn borer. It didn't look like anything I had seen. And I dug around, and it turned out to be stock borer, which I had, I've never seen stock borer one time in my life. This was a first for me. It, it's not uncommon. I just had never seen it. And this is a very interesting um, insect that has many more instars to go. I'm trying to raise some out, but it moves in from, from weedy edges, and I think that's why that it was there. I will take questions. I will stop sharing now. I will see if there's anything in the chat box or if you have any questions on bugs. Chris, I have a question about uh, corn borers going into this younger corn. Are we going to see the BT doing its job in that situation, or are we seeing corn borer uh, overcoming some of this resistance that's out there. If you see a field of BT with corn borer in it, you call me right away. The BT should be doing its job here. There is no reason why it should be failing here. The picture I showed you was in conventional corn, and th that's not a surprise because we have more people with conventional corn trying to shave costs or, or trying to grow for a non-GM market. Um, and, you know, this then you have to spray that in that kind of situation. But if you're in a BT field and you know it's a BT field, uh, call me right away because I believe there is a permit, a permit on file now to, for me to collect corn borers and ship them to my colleagues over at University of Guelph to establish populations. In fact, I'm looking for corn borer now to collect to establish a, a baseline on BT resistance in Michigan. So I have a way to get those tested. Just drop me a line, send me some pictures, whatever. Don't wait and tell me this in October or something. Tell me it now. So that's, that's a, good, uh, a good point, Phil. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, appreciate the information this morning. Uh, I would like to remind everyone to uh, uh, fill in the, uh, the questionnaire uh, at the end, uh, valuation. We'd appreciate that. Also like to remind everyone tomorrow is uh, – Ag Innovation Day, uh, really with the focus on precision technology that pays. So I think there's a pretty exciting program that uh, is available for those who who have an opportunity to attend. Uh, it's it's free of charge. Uh, registration is at, at 8.30. Uh, it's at University Farms on the campus. Uh, so you don't have to register, sign up, but we'd certainly like to, to invite everyone to, to participate. Uh, I also like to Thank everybody for attending this morning. Uh, again, fill out the survey if you have the opportunity. Uh, please join the MSU Field Crops team on Twitter and like us on Facebook for additional information. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and, and have a good rest of the day and rest of the week. Thank you.